Hey guys, and welcome back to the Global TQM podcast. Today's episode is pretty cool because I've got a new format. Firstly, let's say a big hi to Kevin, my co-host. How are you doing, Kevin? Good to be back, David. Uh, we're just quarantining away here in the States. I know. Thank God, thank God for Zoom. I mean, we've been doing this on Zoom for years, but um, it, it, it is great that we can continue with some things like normal. Absolutely. Way ahead of the curve. Way ahead of the curve. <laughs> Before our time, I guess. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, so, guys, today we're doing a little bit of a different format. If you're listening to this, you won't be able to see it. But if you're actually watching this um, on YouTube or on our blog, um, you'll be able to see the accompanying slide deck, which we thought would be a really great format to present this podcast because we'll bullet point everything out on the deck for you. And I know some people are visual and you can always kind of refer back to it or take some screenshots of important stuff. And if you like this format, let us know and we'll keep going with it. So today's topic is really a question I get asked a lot. Um, and I thought I would address it and talk about it. It's really a discussion on what are the best sourcing methods to use. And um, it's quite a debated topic, but I'll give you my honest and frank outline and view on it. And of course, full disclosure, I'm extremely biased towards global TQM and what we offer because that's why we offer it, because we believe in it. But to be fair, I thought let's talk through every single case and let's um, look at what those methods are because there is a lot of good in all methods and we in it also use all methods. So I thought I'd introduce you to that. Just some background for those of you who don't know me and kind of want some context as to why I'm qualified to talk about these topics or the subject is I've attended over 100 trade shows globally in probably about 20 different countries. Um, I started like this in this business, in this industry, and I've visited tons, hundreds and hundreds of factories. Um, I moved to China um, about 16 years ago. And because of that, you know, all resulting from our need and requirements to source products. And we've shipped many famous brands in hundreds of millions of US dollars out of China. So all of that really um, has given me a deep insight into what the best sourcing methods are. And I'm gonna kind of walk you through each of them today. Kevin, you got any questions yet? No, I just, we've just gone through the background and I am anxious to uh, see the different sources that you're gonna go through. Great. So firstly, there's actually four main ways to source, right? There's your typical online platforms, which I think everybody's using now. Um, things like Alibaba, Global Sources, Made in China, and many, many more. And who can say which is the best one? Well, they've all got different benefits or slightly different strategies. We'll get into each one in a little bit more detail, but just generally, online platforms is one key way to source and of course they do have their pros and they do have their cons but we use them and i'll tell you how we use them then the second key way is trade shows um, we attend a lot of the major trade shows in china we attend a lot of major trade shows in hong kong um, ces in las vegas is a very well-known famous trade show um, and there's many different product categories um, and trade shows around the world. So depending on what product you're looking for, you will kind of determine which country is the best country to produce that category of product. And the other really important thing to consider with trade shows is some trade shows are designed for their local domestic market and other trade shows are designed for the international export market. So you don't want to get caught up visiting a domestic trade show where the suppliers can't export their product. And can I, can let me ask off. you a question really quickly between these two platforms real quick. So the online platform, is it normally cheaper than it is to go through the trade show route because the trade show is more in person and, and you have to actually be, have a presence there? It, it, it's very different. I've, I've actually got a slide where I'm gonna walk through the pros and cons of online platforms versus trade shows. They both, I wouldn't say one is cheaper than the other, but they both have very clear distinct advantages. 
and of course some disadvantages. Right. Um, right. I generally find though, Kevin, it's a blend. I find it's a blend yeah. of the two. Um, because it's all about the homework and research that you do. And CES um, is Consumer Electronics Show, right? In Las CES Vegas. is Consumer Electronics, that's right. Um, and just after that, they've got the SHOT Show, which is like a military apparel, clothing, gear show. Um, if you just literally go onto the, the website um, for like CES, you'll see all the different product categories they do over and over and over again. Um, it's, it's the best way to find trade shows. And I highly recommend trade shows. Um, they're not the final answer, but I think they play a key, key, key role. And I don't think our business would be where they are today if it wasn't for trade shows. Right. Um, Kevin, the other two primary ways of sourcing is a lot of people use agents. So using an agent um, can be very good and helpful. They're often experienced in one specific area. Um, they often have an existing network or relationship that might be helpful or useful to what you're trying to achieve. Um, they're very often a one man, one woman show, which means that they can be quite honest, sincere and loyal to you and very, very hard working. And I find a lot of people that I know that use an agent, they find them online somewhere and they start working with them and they kind of build a nice little friendship and relationship with them and you know that help them blend that cultural divide so agents can be helpful in specific circumstances and i do know people that have been successful with agents then the final way is really what i call a group as platforms and community sourcing and that's really um, where we fit in and how we see ourselves and I think one of the things with platforms and community sourcing is just that, it's community. One of the key differentiators is it's often run by successful entrepreneurs. And that, for me, is quite important for a business that wants to grow. And the, I guess a disadvantage is there is always a cost for the services and the information. It's not free like a platform. But there's a reason for that, and we'll go into that. And typically a platform and a sourcing community is a much more of a robust process. So those are really kind of your four choices. You've got the online platforms, you've got trade shows, you've got agents, and then you've got kind of sourcing and community platforms like us, which as you can imagine, leaves a lot of people wondering what's right for me, what should I be doing? You know, there's pros and cons to a done for you service or a done with you service or some people just want to do a course and figure out how to do it themselves. Courses normally aim towards like the Alibabas and the online. You know, how do you source from the online platforms? Yeah, sure. They're all real choices. And you don't actually have to be exclusive to one. I find they all serve a purpose. But um, to kind of highlight a few of the key um, takeaways for me on, on how I look at them and how I view them and what I think people should be aware of and conscious of when dealing with them. Um, we'll start with the online platforms. The first thing to remember with an online platform is their business model is to list thousands of factories. That is their business model. There's a platform that's, that have got people dedicated to just getting as many factories listed as possible because that gives them scale, it gives them scope, and it makes them the perceived go-to place for sourcing. Um, now, some of them have got a vetting process where the suppliers can get vetted and accredited and badged, but it's a very clinical process. And what I mean when I say clinical, it, for, for us and in our experience, um, Vetting a supplier is as much an emotional and relationship um, thing as it is a ticking off the boxes of a, um, a creditor. Do they have certain um, audits done? Um, are they a registered company? You know, there's the clinical vetting process, which is important, but there's another hugely important factor, which is a non-clinical process, which is relationships, willingness, cooperation levels, the values, the philosophies of the management, that all matters substantially and, and, and should not be overlooked. Um, I think um, 
the other kind of key point is um, these platforms charge the manufacturers. So while they're free to you to source, you have to understand that they do charge the manufacturers to list their products on there. And the more a manufacturer pays, the higher their ranking in tiers and status goes, right? So that kind of locks the factories in to keep their status. So a factory wants to be a gold supplier, a platinum supplier, or whatever the ranking system is, there's a commercial aspect to that that costs the factory money and they have to keep paying to get it. And, and platforms will spend a lot of money and have teams just recruiting onboarding factories. And for me, that lacks the substance of those relationships, the willingness, the attitude, the cooperation levels, the values of the company. And that's something I'll talk a bit about in, in, in more detail. Um, the other really important thing to understand about online platforms is factories have to qualify customers just as we try to qualify the factories. And a lot of people say, oh, I went online and I get such bad service. People don't come back to me. And, and you know, it's just so frustrating. And I go, well, what do you think, right? These guys have got thousands of factories. They're getting tens of thousands, you know, hundreds of thousands of millions of people sending Probably. inquiries yep. and RFQs to them. And the factory just employs dozens of people to crank these things out like widgets because they don't know who's serious and who's not serious. Right. And that there is the key reason that people actually get such low standards of service often through these trading platforms because they're vetting the customers as much as you're vetting them as a supplier, right? And, and you can break through that using online platforms but it just takes a certain character, a certain energy, a certain persistence and consistency. And if you're asking the wrong questions or things like that, they're going to pick up straight away, you know, if you're a serious buyer or not a serious buyer. So that's just something to be aware of. Um, the other thing that makes it very difficult is it's really hard to benchmark and gauge. Yeah, I would imagine. Uh, yeah. You, you can imagine people are just sending you quotes and offers and prices fluctuate so much, but you really have to figure out a way to benchmark those quotes and make sure you're comparing apples with apples. And I talk a lot about that in other training programs I do, so I won't get into too much, but the biggest thing is being able to benchmark and gauge which quotes are comparable and which are not, because there could be changes in materials and specs or, or, or just even a misunderstanding on the way you communicate with your requirements. Um, so those are kind of the things to keep in mind with the online platform. Now, many people have been super successful sourcing from online platforms. I have in certain circumstances, not in all. So it, it certainly is an option and it is a way to go, but I think it's very important to understand how they work, understand these things that I've just laid out now and work within that space, understand right. that right. space and navigate it accordingly. Let me ask you a quick question before we go to the next slide that if it looks like to me that that uh, when you were talking about, you know, factories have to be locked in to keep their good status and it's like a, it's almost like an SEO process of trying to rank on the pages of these online platforms for specific products. The problem is that it it's, doesn't speak to quality at all. It just speaks to the amount of money you've spent to, 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 uh, I guess, acquire that ranking. 100% correct. And and the guys that are good at that will rank higher, get the RFQs, and, and it does. It becomes a, a statistical number game. Right. And from my experience, when you're sourcing a product, um, to avoid frustrations, relationships and willingness are as important as the factory's ability to rank high on an on a, on a online platform. Exactly. Yeah. So... But, but you do get to talk to them. You do get the suppliers' context. And if you have that, and that's why I end off, um, Kevin, with saying it's for a certain type of person. You know, some people will hop online with those suppliers all day long, every day, and talk to them and get to know them and build that relationship through the initial contact they made on the online platform. So it's not to say it doesn't work. Of course it works. Right. But you have to know what time, experience, and effort you have to put into it and do what works for you. That makes sense. Exactly. Great. So trade shows, 
um, is one of my favorites. Um, the best thing for me about a trade show is you just got all your suppliers in one place. And, and of course, you can physically see the products. To me, there's just no better way to walk around halls in a couple of days and meet supplier after supplier and physically see product after product. If you remember when we were talking about online platforms, you can't see the physical product. Right. Exactly. It's hard to benchmark the, the stats. Whereas now when you can go to supply, pick up the product, and go, oh, yours is $10, you go to the next guy, it's $5, you go, well, I can clearly see why. <laughs> mm -hmm. I would right. think you would also see the professionalism of the, of the representatives themselves. I mean, you, you exactly. see them in person. Exactly. It's much easier to build a relationship with them because you're talking to a human, you're connecting, and you get a sense for their style and their willingness to help you. And that's really important. Um, so I think trade shows bridge that gap for me compared to, you know, these online platforms, you get physical product, you get the speed of seeing people and you meet those people face to face, which, which is huge. And they meet you. Cause remember what I said, just like you're vetting the suppliers, the suppliers are vetting you. So when they meet you, it's your chance to build a reputation or build, build a rapport and, and make an impression and it can take you seriously. Um, so not all, the other, I, I guess one of the challenges of trade shows is not all booths are run by factories. Um, sometimes there's a training company there and not the factory, but you can talk to them and figure that out. Um, but essentially, Trade shows are great for all those reasons. And I think that's kind of one of the highlights. I think where a lot of people fall short is misunderstanding the follow-up work required after a trade show. Right, exactly. That's the key yeah. to success. Um, and I know we're running tight on time, so I'll try not to repeat myself too many times. Um, but just to touch on the last point, which I've kind of bundled together because obviously it's, it's close to home. It's close to what we do. And that is using agents versus DWU, which I know you're going to ask me what that means. <laughs> it's done with you services, right? Like global TQM. That's essentially what we are. We're a done with you service compared to a done for you service. So I just thought I kind of, explain some of the key differences between a done with you service and agents because people get confused and for me there's some very clear distinctions of lines so first firstly teams are critical in sourcing that's really important to understand a one-man show is very difficult to have the right experience and i look at our sourcing and how we work um, we always need the advice of engineers of inspectors of our compliance people, of our shipping people, right? We've got a lot of we've got different people in different product categories. And just being able to talk to those teams brings everything together. And, and the, what we don't know, we've got access to resources like labs or other third parties we deal with or experience with that we can get the answers. And very often I find that's where agents fall short versus sourcing team, right? It's just that access and that experience. The other thing is process is crucial. Very often agents will have will work on a specific relationship they have and they'll be very emotionally attached to that. Whereas a sourcing team with a done with you service or platform, and it's not just us, there's others out there, you know, full disclosure. Um, process is critical, right? You've got to take the emotion out of it. Because if they don't follow certain processes, if they can't meet certain requirements, if they can't be vetted and accredited, it really becomes a problem. Whereas if you emotionally invested in one or two contacts you have in your industry as an agent, um, you do everything to fight for, to make certain things happen and you can end up with blinkers on. And it's really important to cast that net out wide. Um, the other very important thing I find is that um, the lack of formal commercial contracts and business practices, right? Very often a local agent will basically have a relationship and a simple PR or PO process, but they lack the, the kind of commercial documentation that you need to have in place, you know, to protect trademarks, um, to make sure there's NNN agreements and 
non-disclosures and non-circumvention agreements in place and certain things that are a bit more, uh, what's the right word I'm looking for? Like compliance driven and, you know, kind of weed out bad suppliers. I think mm -hmm. it's really important. And then, of course, you know, the working experience with suppliers is critical and it's always better to work with people that have actually bought from suppliers, shipped from these suppliers. And I think that works for both with, with the Done With You platform and an agent. Both normally have that. I think one is just probably normally wider and higher volume. The big difference, I think, with a Done With You service is that you get to learn as you go. Yeah. You can run solo, right? If you're working with a good team, you're going to learn how they do it, they're going to learn how they work, and you can end up doing a lot of that on your own. And the key, key, key point for me is the only way to avoid mistakes is access to seasoned entrepreneurs that have successfully run businesses like yours. And, and I say that to people over and over again, it doesn't matter whether you're working with us, an agent, a, a sourcing company online, directly with a factory, there's just stuff that's going to come up. There's going to be weird things going on and there's going to be decisions that need to be made. And, and if you've got access to an entrepreneur who runs their own businesses, sources China from products from China on their own for themselves, they've been through that learning curve and they can help you close that gap. There's a whole commercial gap and after sales service gap. There's a lot of little gaps that you're going to make sensible decisions because you've got access to the right advice. And that's really like what I feel the core fundamental difference is, is that philosophy and attention to detail. And then of course, just the ability to communicate fast, smooth, rapidly in your language. Um, does that make sense, Kevin? Absolutely. Yes. I was going to ask you really quickly, is there a, is there a licensing difference between agents and kind of the community sourcing team? I would, I would feel probably much more comfortable in the vetting process of a team versus just one individual out there. Uh, especially yes. if we're dealing internationally over, you know, over electronic media and, uh, you know, I'm not on site anyway. I would, I would feel just more, I, I guess, more trust and more, um, that there's a, a higher likelihood of, of being truly authentic and, and reliable, I guess is a, is a good word. Yeah. I, I think that comes down to like the process driven, um, um, approach where, um, you know, not everybody can be an expert at everything. Exactly. So, yeah. for example, we've got guys that are specialists at auditing factories. They look for completely different things to when our like sourcing people go into a factory. They they're looking at the, the products and the categories, and they get all excited about that. Whereas our technical guys are looking at the production facilities, um, and so on. And so everybody looks at things differently, and there's a process to it all. So it is really the sum of the parts that make right. it good. So I thought I'd just kind of summarize the top five things to look for in your sourcing choice. And for me, they really come down to learn as you go. You want to make sure whoever you're working with is teaching you what they do and how they do it. And you get all those commercial templates so that you can use them by yourself later. The biggest point for me is owning your data, right? Is you want to work with somebody that gives you a full supplier list, all the offers received when they're working on your project, so that you can build your Rolodex and your product library. Half of sourcing is building your supplier Rolodex and your product library because you want to do more and more products and you might get a new idea and you said, oh, I already found this supplier before. So that transparency and building your Rolodex for products and suppliers is just critical. And that's the way we work, Kevin, and that's one of the biggest differentiators. I'm very proud of that. The third thing you want to look for is um, you want to work with somebody that's scalable on demand, which means when you need their help, you can reach out to them and get their help on any level, whether it's advice or whether it's to actually do something for you or whether it's to facilitate doing something for you. That's why I always say done with you, not done for you. Mm -hmm. Right? So scalable on demand, I think is important because you're going to come and go. There's going to be some parts of the project you run with on your own because it's more cost effective, more efficient, whatever the case may be. You want to make sure they've got a team for compliance and quality. You definitely don't want to rely on the same person negotiating the commercial terms or discussing commercial terms, then being responsible 
at the same factory to check the quality and the compliance. It's too much for one person and the lines get blurred. And the last thing you want to look for is make sure you've got that experienced entrepreneur or experienced entrepreneurs running it that you've got access to because they're going to just help you make those little decisions and get things over the line without you wondering whether you're making the right choices or not. So Kevin, I mean, just very simply put, a lot of people find it frustrating, daunting, or simply time consuming. And for any of those reasons, you know, it's always good to reach out to an agent, to a sourcing platform, um, to reduce those frustrations, right? And to save time, time and communication is probably one of the best things you save. Now, I thought I would touch on this because a lot of people don't understand how to use a sourcing team efficiently, right? And the process of sourcing. So you can use a sourcing team depending on the stage you're at, right? So sometimes you might just want to do homework and research into product category. And I think let me back up. When I say a sourcing team, it might be you and your agent. It might be you and us. It might be you online right. using a platform, right? It doesn't right. matter how you yeah. look at it. The stages are the same. There's use it to do the homework, right? Homework literally means you've got an idea, you've got a concept, you think this can work, you don't know, right? Don't assume every sourcing project doesn't end in success, right? Because you go through the homework to check the pricing, the feasibility, the willingness of people to operate, and all that homework then tells you, are you competitive? Can you get the right product you want? And does it still make sense to bring in and import, right? That's the homework. You can't do that. There's the R&D side, which is if you're developing a product, there's a lot of working with manufacturers to understand technically what's possible. So you might have to do some pivots and some changes. And then there's simply just building your RFQ from that information, which is outlining exactly what your final requirements are because they change and evolve over time. They might start here and end up here because of that homework and R&D that you're doing. Then you really start the heavy vetting of suppliers, the sampling, the benchmarking, and, and all of that before you even place an order. So very often, we just focus in on one of those areas because the project might be terminated at the homework stage. And that's a perfectly reasonable conclusion to come to. That's why you do it. And I think a lot of people underestimate the amount of homework that goes into any sourcing project um, because they think if I start it, I must be right and there must be, the conclusion must be success. But actually, you, you're proving through the journey whether your product is viable. If that makes sense. Is there any stage that it's best to use a sourcing team in those stages? Like when is the, the best? I mean, you said you can, you can, you can uh, incorporate a sourcing team at any stage of there, but is there one level that, that where you really, this is where you really have your highest value as a sourcing team in one of those levels? Yes. I think there's two cases. Um, the, the one is, a very a mature business, it doesn't matter if it's an online business or a bricks and mortar business, but a mature business that kind of wants to take themselves to the next level um, and grow a, maybe a new product range or their own private label brand um, and need to do that quickly should definitely use a team in a company like ours because they're going to need that full backup and that support and they need to get, they need to accelerate that and get it going. For the smaller guy or startup guy, um, it comes to, it's a different reason. I think the smaller startup guy is going to, it's going to be time versus what they know about themselves as an individual, right? right. So is it going to be, right? Because you, there's a lot to learn, there's a lot to figure out, and some people don't have the time to do that, and they just don't maybe have the personality or character to deal with that. They'd rather have somebody taking that headache off from them you know, they've got kids at home, they've got other lives going on, they're busy with other stuff. They just want something to take care of that stuff for them. So then you kind of want to have that team and infrastructure around you. I think the biggest thing, Kevin, that I want to end off on is very simply that 
what people have to understand is that we cannot replace you. No sourcing agent can replace you. No sourcing company can replace you because if everything you're sourcing comes from you, right? The energy you have to put in, the, your requirements, your information, your expectations, it's all you. And no agent is ever going to basically replace you. You have to still check your samples. You have still got to go through the microscopic details. You've got to do that. That's the input you have to put in to make any sourcing um, job successful. If there was anything that, that you touched on that I think is, is that has surprised me the most in this entire presentation is the ability for me as somebody that wants to source products in China to own my own data. That back in like slide 10 uh, or slide nine, that's amazing that, that uh, you all provide that service. Yeah, yeah. Look, the, the, the biggest thing is that for, for me is, I, and I like emphasize this to people all the time, is, is that just we can't replace you. Nobody can replace you. If you're going on these journeys, you have to own your brand. You have to own your product. You could, it's a reflection of you. You can have a team to help you to shorten the length of time, but it can't replace you. What a great, great way to wrap up today. And uh, just just to, as you kind of close the, uh, the session today, I mean, just everything was kind of culminated in this idea that it, you really, you said that it's done with you service versus done for you service. And that's exactly why you emphasize that in this last slide. Exactly, it kind of bring, bring, brings it home. So I think that wraps it up. Um, if anybody's got any questions, feel free to reach out to us and I uh, hope that was interesting and insightful and um, we'll see you in the next one or two weeks.